Hello and a very warm welcome to The Real Talk. As we like to say on the program, The Real Talk brings you real people with real life experiences that we do hope will steer you to get up and do something amazing with yourself. My name is Jackie and it is a pleasure to host the show. Our guest today is an author. Well, maybe that should have come last, don't you think so? She is a communicator. She is an entrepreneur. She is also a content creator. But above all, the author of Shaped. Barbara Umhoz is our guest today. Good to see you, Barbara. Good to see you, Jack. Thank you so much for making time to sit down with us. Let me tell you, when Lumbasi calls, you just yeah. have to show up. So thank you for the invite. My pleasure. And you know I would say that about you. Eh? you. When Barbara comes calling, you don't ask where, when, uh-uh. You run. Thank you. Thank I hope you. you've been well. I've been very well. Yeah. Thank you, yes. Yeah. Barbara, at the age of 6'10", something that I thought was um, <laughs> quite strange, mm -hmm. at 16, you are in the UK. Mm -hmm alone living in your apartment so i've been living alone for a very long time but i didn't start at 16. i know <laughs> no i didn't start at 16. Very i wild. did not think that my parents would allow me I know. to even think about it and so at that age you were studying mm -hmm. while volunteering and i would love to start this conversation from that point of volunteering being that we are in a country with a very young population and i would love to hear it from you what did that foundation do to impact the Barbara that we see today in entrepreneurship, communication space, and content creation and all. I would love you to take us back to that time. And if there's anything you'll say, thanks to me volunteering for organization A, I was able to do this later on in my life. Well, um, I, I find that volunteering in our context is quite new. Because most young people, they go to school, after school, it's expected you apply for a job, you get a job, you start making money. But we see that it's getting tougher and tougher to get a job. So when you go for volunteering, it's kind of like taking a creative route to finding yourself work. So when I started volunteering, though in Shaped, I focus on my volunteering in church, but I was also working for a Christian bookshop and I offered them services. I was young and I told them, look, I have never worked before in this country uh, besides the interpretation work I used to do. So I started volunteering. It was a bookshop. I would go and arrange books, arrange books, arrange CDs, clean the shelves. I mean, and I wasn't getting paid. I would actually pay for my transport to go to the city center, to go to that bookshop and work as <laughs> if I'm getting paid. I was going to ask, is it because you had a lot of money? No. Oh, no. Because again, if, if that is no. money that I'm supposed to use for rent, no. why am I investing no. it in going no. to no. It spend time it, somewhere for no. free? No. Yeah. It was allowance that we would be given as young asylum seekers at the time. Okay. I also talk about it in the book. So I would go clean the shelves, arrange books. Uh, it Volunteering then prepared me for a job that I did in one of the chain supermarkets there in London, in the UK, Max and Spencer's. Those who live there know the place, uh, the places. So, because I, 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 I learned how to organize. I learned how to organize. I learned how to be disciplined. I learned how to be committed. From that bookshop. Yeah, mm. this bookshop, I'm not getting paid. I learned how to respect leadership. Yeah. The people who, who were leading me yet not paying me. Mm. I learned how to submit myself. I learned, I learned lessons like if you're working with the, the people of the land, these English people, and the shop was owned by Caucasians, well, white English people. I was the only black face in that place oh. at the time. So most of the clients that would walk in would be elderly, uh, middle-class white people. Mm -hmm. And they would find this young... Black. Black. Slender girl. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was slender back then. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was quite an experience. Because I got to see how they approach business. I got to learn customer care. I got to learn how to communicate to clients when they come and they ask for products. I learned so many things that, you know, 
By mm. the time I got a job working for Max and mm. working for Max and Spencer's, because I was also working in the storage room, we would be packing cartons of food. I would working on the I would be working on the till. So by the time I got that job, I really knew my way around customer care. You had gained experience. I had gained experience. Yeah. So it, it was one of one of the greatest experiences of my life yeah. living there. Besides working in church, mm. because now volunteering in church was something else. It was because, different. Yeah, it was very different. I found myself in a community of Randons. I found myself in the, in the leadership team and I was very young. I was like 19, 20 in the leadership team. So I learned leadership skills. I learned communication skills. I was not getting paid. So bring that back to the context we have in our country. If parents can afford to have you in the house and you're not paying rent, you're not paying any bills. You're not buying food. You're not buying food. If they can pay your transport mm -hmm. to find a place or even get the connections because sometimes your parents can find a connection, a place where you can volunteer because yeah. not everyone wants to give a job to someone who just graduated from school. We don't know what they know, what they don't know. And maybe we, we don't want to invest in letting them yeah. know unless if we are hiring them. Mm. But now there is volunteering and there is intentional positioning. So you give me What's this place. Difference? Yeah, let me elaborate on that. Yeah. You're giving me a place to volunteer. But me, I'm coming with a mindset of positioning myself. <laughs> So I'm coming to volunteer, but I'm going to make sure that by the time I finish my volunteering season, you will hire me. Great. So how about you approach volunteering with intentional positioning of yourself as a potential employee? You want to walk in a room and leave a mark. Yeah. And even if you're just graduating from university, and you don't have experience, but you want to be that person where the employer, the supervisor, the person who's been working with you will be like, we need to hire her. Yeah. Like she needs to stay. Yes. You, you're, you're done with your internship period, but they're saying, no, we're not letting go of this one. Yeah. We this is her. gold. We're yeah. keeping her. So even as the young people uh, watch this show, I want them to think, how do I position myself such that when the season of volunteering has come to an end, I can also be recommended elsewhere. Maybe this organization, maybe this business can't hire you, but your supervisor knows well, someone so somewhere, looking somewhere looking for someone to hire, and you get hired like that. I love that we're talking about it because it's possible that our young people have not had a conversation on volunteering because well, well, all we know is internship for three months or two months and mm -hmm. someone is done. And they do it for academic purposes. Because yeah. the university requires one to have internship, they'll do it. But now there's an opportunity for them to look at it differently. Mm -hmm. Go in knowing that this is an opportunity for you to work with excellence and be retained or be recommended. And it's in the small details. People will be observing you in the small details. I'll give you one example. Yeah. This lady calls me. She's like, I've seen that you're into the book writing business. Do you need a writer? Uh -huh. I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe not. But I don't, I fail to find time for her. And she keeps insisting. She keeps insisting. Then the day I, I finally get time to meet her, she comes on time. And I'm like, okay, I'm watching, I'm watching. She comes on time. When we meet to talk, it's not about the challenges she's been facing. It's about business. And she's young, and I could see she's a graduate. Yeah. She's like, I'm looking for writing gigs, anything. I'm like, OK, I have a few projects in the pipeline. I will let you know. Then I ask her, can you write on different topics? She's like, yes, when do you want it? I'm like, today. Give me topics. I'll write on them today. Jackie, I give her hard topics, two hard topics. Mm. She goes, in, in uh, three hours, she has already submitted wow. those write-ups. Wow. I've not, that, I've that, not, that is impressive. I have not found the opportunity to hire her, but rest assured, her name is somewhere. Cause and even if it won't be you hiring her, I know you would recommend her. I would so recommend her. Yeah. So people are watching. So even when you go for volunteering, it's not just a place to go so that you don't spend time at home. 
go with this go with the mindset that i am positioning myself for a job i am positioning myself for opportunities yeah give it your best I give it, give your, it your best, best yeah. yes Those always the maximize on every opportunity even if the opportunity is not paying you cash you just don't know where that opportunity will take you but how long did it take you to write the book shade it's for me it's a precious gift that you gave to us thank you thank you thank you for this yeah how long did it take you the COVID years, I would say two years. One of the topics that you touch on mm -hmm. is a very thorny uh, subject. And I want to know how you felt as uh, you, you were writing that particular issue, knowing that we're in Africa and divorce is frowned upon, that you stand the risk of losing family, friends, opportunities. You're an MC, but then I'll... I, I, I would be scared thinking, hey, will that person call me to be an MC again? <laughs> now you, that they know I'm a divorcee. You're know? not a role model now. <laughs> you're not a role model. And so I wonder, I wonder how, um, from your personal experience, how best would you say we should approach the issue of divorce as a society? Oh my God, that's a very packed uh, question. Yeah. Well, um, hmm, let me say this. When I was writing Shape, I was going through the process, the separation and the divorce itself. That's why I was journaling, because I had started going for therapy, for counseling. And my therapist had told me one of the best ways to survive this is to journal everything you're feeling, everything you're thinking. And then we were in COVID, we were locked down in the house. So the only thing I could do was journal. Yeah. So I start journaling. And thank you for asking this question. I think you're the first person I've had this conversation with. Uh -oh. Yes, and I've done a lot of media. <laughs> You've done media tours, you yes. read the book, so, but not touched on this particular. Jackie, you're very special. So thank you for blessing me with this. Huh? Yes, yeah. you're very special like that. <laughs> so, um, and I, I'll tell you why I intentionally stayed away from it. But anyway, okay. so um, I started actually with a divorce chapter when I started journaling. Because mm. it was intense, it was painful. I was strange. going through so many emotions. So I start with that. And after starting with that, then I go back, I write the whole book. But I keep going to that chapter because it's, it's still happening. It's real, it's raw, it's painful. By the time I submitted my first manuscript to the person who helped me um, write this book and clean it up, the book is literally almost like 60% divorce. I'm having all these ideas and the lessons and all this. And then he tells me, his name is Gael, um, Gael Rutembesa. He tells me, okay, so is this a divorce come out book? Yeah. I'm like, no, I don't want my first story to be divorce. Mm. There's so much, there are so many layers around my life and my experiences. This, this is not the defining chapter of my life. So, so he tells you, let's switch things. So we switch things, yeah. we, we cut it, uh, we take out a lot of content and we decide we're going to think what to do in the future with the content we've cut out. And like I said, you're very special. I get to announce that I have a second book in the works, wow. which will focus entirely on that chapter. Wonderful. Anyway, so fast forward, I'm writing this and I'm going through this experience and I'm going through all these, ex these emotions while I write this. And by the time I was writing it, I had already faced the rejection. You, you're serious about that? Yes, I had already the, faced The people around you, the close yes, people that know the people about around it, me that, already treating you a certain way. Yes, and the family is not understanding. Not, well, not the whole family, but some members of the family are like, you've brought shame to the family. Yeah. Anyway, so I not associate. Yes. So we go through that and it was really hard. It was hard. This is one of the reasons why it is a very touchy topic for our African societies. Mm. I, I totally understand. Mm. So I go through those emotions. For me, I'm thinking I am working on my healing. What the society thinks, the society will be fine. Mm. Let me just survive this. I need to survive this and uh, thrive. There is surviving and there is thriving. I need to survive, but also thrive, also live. So mm. society will be fine. Yeah. So I go through that. Uh, I, it, it never occurred to me um, 
it's a whole it's a whole it's a whole journey that's why i'm coming up with we a book wait for that book, yes Barbara, yeah but i go through seasons where i'm like do i you know you know how people how, how you meet people and everyone is like so how is your husband and i'm like yeah how do I start telling them I don't know where he is now? Yes, mm. but, but when it came to business, I intentionally, intentionally positioned myself as a woman entrepreneur, not a wife doing business, uh -uh. not a daughter doing business, though I am all those things, I was all those things, not as a mother doing business, though I could put on those hats at different times, but I position myself as a random woman doing business. business, a random woman seeking to take advantage of the opportunities that have been made available for her. Mm -hmm. So I had to find it in myself to walk into a room and not cower, like walk straight. Look, you have all this story, on my life it's okay but i need this gig i need to make money from this whether you judge me or not i need this money i i have the skills the skills never left this is one of the things i'll talk about in my second book that yes we go through divorce but the skills don't leave we just go through pain and depression and different things we deal with that come with that chapter of our lives but the skills don't leave. They the don't, knowledge they don't that live you, with the marriage, they don't yeah, live with the husband. Like, like my communication skills didn't go because the marriage ended. No. Uh, and my my drive and hunger for business and for learning didn't go. Well, I didn't. I didn't allow it to go because sometimes because others that do allow it to go. Sometimes the experience is so painful that it can momentarily be elusive for you. But it doesn't really leave. You just need the support and the strength and people to tell you, look, you've got to survive this. You've got to keep living. You've got to keep doing what you have to do. Life doesn't end here. You've got to overcome this. You've got to overcome this. But there are people who never find that support. So I also understand. Just hold, hold that thought, Barbara, yeah. because I want us to speak to a very special person out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching The Real Talk. And our guest today is Barbara Umhoza. She's an entrepreneur, a content creator. She's a communicator. She's a fabulous author of the book Shaped End. As you had, there's a second book on its way. She will not tell us when, but that is something for us to look forward to. Yes. We are coming to you from Kigali Serena Hotel, and it is such a pleasure to have you with us. Please do show us your love, support, send those questions and comments using the hashtag The Real Talk. Welcome back to The Real Talk. We're coming to you from Kigali Serena Hotel. And this is a show that brings you real people with real life stories. We're talking to Barbara Umuhoza. Barbara, there's a woman that is watching us today and she's struggling with this same issue of divorce. And maybe uh, she's not even started the journey. She's holding back because there's someone to be accountable to. What do I tell my parents? They are church people. How will the villagers view them? What will my colleagues say? Okay, how about the children? And so this is a woman or a man. Or a man. I was yes. about to say, or a man. Thank you very much. Or a man. Thank you, because the, yes. those questions will come on both ends. Yes, yes. So it's a woman or a man who is struggling. And the reason they are is because much as they're the ones going through this issue that has brought them to that point of, I want out, they're still considerate of the very many external factors, their children, their relatives, opportunities, gigs that they could lose and all that. What would you say to such a person, that man or woman? Why do you ask heavy packed questions? Oh, goodness, because you've given me the grand <laughs> opportunity to be the only person in this country asking you this. Yes. In fact, not the country, the whole world. <laughs> I've never had the conversation on this, so yeah. this was reserved for when the second book comes, but yes. thank you for preempting this. <laughs> okay, so it's a man, it's a woman. Uh, by the time they have reached the level of considering a divorce, it means they have had a very challenging very challenging, borderline, very difficult marriage. Let's first establish that. Very challenging. I add very because marriage is challenging in the sense that it will challenge our backgrounds. I mean, two different people from different backgrounds, from different mindsets, different life experiences, 
come together and decide that they have to be one, think alike, think together, work together, grow together. Really? It's not easy. There is no school that teaches us how to do marriage, right? Mm -hmm. No school that teaches us how to do parenting, right? Unless if you're resourceful, if you go on YouTube, if you read books, and not many people have the time for that, or are not even aware that they need to do that to learn. So then you put them together and you tell them that they have to suddenly become one happy family. So marriage can be very challenging and very difficult. So before this person considers a divorce, they have had so many years of pain, of uh, walking on eggshells, of heartbreak, of crying, of, 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 of. So they reach a point where they have to consider this other option, the ugly, frowned upon. The un-African, the un-Rwandan. And Christian. And Christian. <laughs> Approach. <laughs> so, what would I tell them? Uh, first of all, your life is your life. Before it is your wife's life. Before it is your husband's life. Before it is your children's life. What kind of life? do you believe you deserve to live? With that question, because of the backlog of pain, some people don't actually believe they deserve to live a good life. The lines are blurred. You see what I mean? Good is so blurry. They have lost sight of so much that by the point or the time they reach here, they're like, should I quit? Should I stay? Should I leave? Should I go? Should I stay? Should I? These are the things that go through their minds before they make the decision. I call that the transition. Jackie, I'm not giving my whole book here, but I call, that, don't. Yes, I I... call that the transition. Hi. So the transition is where many people either decide to divorce or to stay in the transition. And if they are lucky, they both work their way out of the transmission to a recovered marriage or a healed marriage. So it's possible to come out of the, that transition period yes, and say, is. let's try this again. Yes, but with the right tools, with the right support okay. and the right hard work. Because marriage doesn't work itself out. And marriage isn't worked out by one person because that one person's back will break. It's got to be the two of you. It's a team. It's got to be done by the two mm. of you. And when that one person's back breaks, you go back to the transition. And maybe one day one of you will say, I can't do the transition anymore. I'm walking away. Yeah. Now, back to that person who's been in the transition. Stuck there. Because stuck, stuck, stuck. Surely. And, and, and they're losing weight in the process, by the way. Losing weight or gaining weight? Oh, oh, well, either one of the two. Yeah. They could lose weight, they could gain, gain weight. weight. Sometimes they could have, they'll spend days all moody and sunken. Lose, even lose focus. Even lose focus. You're trying to, to juggle so many balls without losing any balls. So it's difficult. So what I would tell them, back to what I said, what is the life you want to live? How do you want to age? Is this something that you should keep doing? If you stop, what's the worst that could happen? If they can answer that question, then they will know if they should stay in the transition or if should they should both work out. Because even the other party is not happy. Truth be told. Truth be told. Yeah. Even the other party is not happy. So mm. this is where they both think, can we work this now intentionally? There is a lot of intentionality lacking in yeah. these things. Yeah. Can we work out this? There is this Bible verse. Again, I'm a pastor. Hey. Hey, I have to I throw in a verse. Yes. No, it's okay. It's okay. The verses will show up randomly, so don't True. worry about it. <laughs> There is a Bible verse that says, work out your salvation. Work out your marriage. Yeah. Let me borrow that verse and say, work out your marriage, both of you. Mm. And if it's not the both of you, it's going to be a very long, painful journey. 
Now, when you go through, it's a different conversation when you actually decide to walk away. That's a different conversation. But yes, society will not treat you kindly because it's still frowned upon. It's not African, but actually people have always separated and divorced. It's just that now it's blasted okay. out there. Mm. People but, are writing it in books. <laughs> yes, yeah. but back in the years, you would find families where, uh, and even today, mm. a husband and a wife don't sleep in the same bedroom. Mm. There is mommy's room, there is daddy's room. Let's call it what it is. Yeah. People stay for different reasons. Yes. yes, the common one being we are staying together for the children. But people stay for different reasons. They will stay, yes, for the children, which I always think it's a lie. I, I have my reasons, and people can stone me for those reasons, mm -hmm. but I can elaborate later on that. But people stay for different reasons. People stay for financial reasons. It could be the assets they have together. And you start thinking, are we about to split this into? Mm -mm. No. No. Or am I about to go broke? It could either be we have so many assets and we're not about to split our assets. Like it's about to become a mess in the, in the city. Yeah. And yeah. Kigali is very small. Hey. You know, if you split, it's going to be the talk of the town everywhere. We, we don't have tabloids in this country, but word spreads. Oh my like God, word of mouth. Word of mouth, yeah. in word of mouth. <laughs> so people choose to stay because of that. Other people choose to stay because maybe one of them has no financial... Um, enabling uh, fi no, fi no finances to sustain them. So they've got to stay together because like, that's the uh, only way they will survive. This house I'm staying in, this house I'm not paying rent yeah. and she is paying the mortgage or he is paying the mortgage. He's paying the fees, he's buying the food. He's, he's doing this, he's doing that, I'm still struggling, he's helping me uh, cover the expenses of my family. I mean, there's, there is so much I'm carrying on my back, I cannot risk to walk away from this. So many balls will fall if I walk away from this. And then there is the stigma around divorce, which tends to affect more women than the, the men. men. I'll talk about that. Yeah. When a marriage ends, the woman wasn't strong enough. Yes. When a marriage ends, the woman wasn't patient enough. When she didn't I treat her husband well. Yeah. She did not know yes. how to keep she, it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When the woman, when the marriage ends, she wasn't wise enough. She wasn't understanding enough. There is, we even have, in the, in the Rwandan context, we have proverbial sayings that facilitate men, such as, let me say this in Kinyarwanda, the errors of a man are his way of being a man. So we easily forgive the men. My brothers, I'm not attacking you. Let's go slowly with this. I'm going somewhere with this. So... The society is already patriarchal. It forgives men. When a marriage ends, no one even checks what the man did wrong. The society will come for the woman. You were not wise. You are not patient. You are not a good woman. You, you, you did this. You did that. You cheated on your husband. So many women will look at the fights are, that are awaiting them, the battle, and be like, oh, I have no fight left in me. I would stay here. <laughs> One of us will <laughs> die before the other. My kids will grow. Yeah. I'll go and take oh. my own room. He will sleep in his room. I'm okay. To the outside world, we are okay, and that's what matters. I'm, I'm not ready to be called a difficult woman, a prostitute, uh, a foolish woman, uh, all these titles they give women when a marriage ends, it's, men are not treated the same. No, no, no. In fact, men, by the time they come out of that marriage, we're out here waiting for them. You know, there's, oh, yes. there's a whole line of women who have no problem with that divorce. Please, bachelor. please. Like, oh, we, we feel sorry for the men. Mm -hmm. There is this way mm -hmm. where our African societies always, and again, my brothers, like disclaimer, I'm not coming for you. There is this way where our African societies uh, treat men as babies, <laughs> big babies. I mean, even when we are getting married yeah. and we are having these bridal showers, the bridal shower aunties will tell you, the man is a baby. That's your firstborn. He's your firstborn. Hmm? Spoil <laughs> him. Treat him right. If this marriage ends, you will have failed. Too much so, work on the woman, this one. <laughs> so the woman carries so much yeah. pain. And so many women, 
will watch this show and be like, I can't be mad like Barbara. <laughs> She's mad. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, me, I'll stay here. So, my dear sisters, you choose to stay. I pray that you find peace in your soul and live a healthy life mentally, physically, spiritually, because we develop other habits as we try to survive the emotional turmoil that is a difficult and very challenging marriage. You know, when you talk about the staying, there could be those that will stay because of the children. And let's say the home is already toxic. Toxic. The re there's just no Do you know, going back. Jackie, what impact does, effect does that have on the child? We underestimate our children. Our children are, are, are not as daft or as unaware as we think they are. They might not find the words to describe the tension in the house, but they feel... There's so, a problem. There's yeah. a problem. Yes. So, originally, a family, when God was building this institution, coming from my Christian background, this institution that is a marriage was meant to be a healthy environment where the father, the mother, the children thrive, grow, live. Happiness is something else, but live joyfully. There are so many challenges in life, but this was a place where we find safety. This is a place where we are meant to explore our God-given gifts, grow together. Glorify God together. together. I, I always say that a marriage is meant to glorify God. Yes. So when, a ch when children are living in such an environment where most of the times, most of the times, the mother is trying to keep everything in place with everything she's got. The children are feeling these funny vibes in the house. There's just a, a spirit in the house that is not safe, that is not glorious, that is not blessed. But you're, stri you're, you're, you're striving to keep everything together. Women do that a lot. Yes. And mothers. At, at the expense of their own wellness. Yeah. So children know, they feel these things. So when they feel these things and you keep trying to keep the house together, these children are watching you and they are developing things in their psyche, in their emotions, in their spirits. They are developing things because of the toxic environment, the war zone. Sometimes we think the silent treatment spares our kids. So there are so many families where we don't like each other, we are staying together, but we will not talk, we will not laugh. We will not hold hands. We will not be nice to each other. We can't, you know, uh, I was about to say we will not kiss, but it's not random. Anyway, <laughs> we will not ha hold hands you and be romantic. Mm. So we are also teaching our kids that this is what marriage looks like, by the way. The silent treatment and everything that you guys yes. are doing. Because yes. the children are observing the parents. They are observing and they are learning all these things. And it's not safe for them. Then one day the children grow. They are grown, they start asking questions or they start deducting things on their own. So you might have stayed for the sake of the kids. I would say, yes, you could stay for the, a, a moment, a short-lived security because eventually in the long term, you, what you stayed for could affect them in the long term. Yeah. You'd think you're helping them You'd think it's good for them, but in actual sense, it will affect them in the long run. It will run. affect them emotionally. It will affect them physically because they will spend a lot of time trying to define the things that they grew up seeing and it will affect how they approach relationships. It will affect who they are as people. Let's take an example, an extreme example where this family drinks. The, the father is drinking to, to deal with his pain. So he's never at home. He has to avoid the house because let's, let's say it as it is. Some, it's a war zone. Some of our <laughs> sisters are not yeah. enabling as, as wives and as companions, as mothers. So this yeah. man chooses to stay for the kids, but he stays outside the household. Like I would drink. So he, he leaves home early, comes, comes back, back late when the, the kids, kids are sleeping. So, so this, this man is an absent father. That will have an impact.
So it's not that he's absent because he wants to be absent. He's absent because he doesn't want to go home and start quarreling with the mother of the kids. They could not be quarreling in the living room, but they're quarreling in the bedroom and the kids can hear the quarrels. And he can't stand attention. He can't be quiet. Sometimes the abuse is too much because that's what abuse will do to you. It will affect you. So this is an extreme example. Then there is the example of this woman who has found other ways to cope with her own pain. This will also affect the children. And I cannot list all the ways. Yeah. So yeah. we could stay for the children, but the reason why we stay could be the same reason that affects and mars our children for the rest of their lives. Could be on that the, dents their self-confidence and yes. everything about it. Yes, them. oh yes, oh yes, yeah. so yeah. much. Because you're trying to survive anyway. Sure. Yeah. As you said, you'll be doing that at the expense of the children. We will come to you as a mother, Barbara. Thank you for watching The Real Talk on RTV. Our hashtag is The Real Talk. If you are picking something out of this conversation, if it's relatable, there's something that Barbara has said, which I feel like, hey, that is speaking to my current situation. Leave us a note. Use that hashtag, uh, The Real Talk. Uh, give us a comment or a question. We will respond to it. What we'd love to do from this, uh, on this program and from these conversations is enable a space where we talk to each other. Probably you're going through a problem and you're thinking you're the only one. Yet, if you open up to that friend or that close sister of yours, you'll realize they've gone through us. And maybe from that conversation between the two of you or what you're hearing from Barbara, you will emerge on the other side victorious and joyful. We will be back. My name is Jackie. We're coming to you from Kigali Serena Hotel. It is a pleasure to have you with us. This is The Real Talk on RTV. As always, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And we're coming to you from the Kigali Serena Hotel. You should check them out on the different social media and see what Kigali Serena Hotel is offering you this season. We're talking to Barbara Umhoza. She's an amazing person, a storyteller. Barbara, I want us to go back to something that you mentioned when we're talking about divorce. And, you know, we're talking about divorce, not saying that uh, <laughs> if you're too tired... So Barbara, when we talk about, we've talked about the issue of divorce and the different circumstances that could lead to that and the different reasons that could keep people in that marriage. How would you describe that fuel that keeps one going or that thing that will make them fight? Actually, the fight. <laughs> it's the fight. It's the fight. Okay. I like to call it the fight. I call it the fight because it's... It's the fight that you have in your soul, in your spirit, to keep going. It's a resolve. It's a resolve to, to say that this marriage is not going to end. But my question is, you are fighting based on what? Are you fighting based on fear? Mm -hmm. That I can't face the society, so I'm staying here. I will lose my mind here. I'll die here, but I'll stay. We've seen people die there. We've seen people die. Yes. There. Men and women. It's an abusive again, relationship, mm. but you're saying, I cannot face the society. I'll stay. So it's a fight. But mm. now, there are people who have lost all the fight in them. It's like, see, I'm not fighting. I'm not, I'm just going to survive. <laughs> Why? What could lead someone to that point? So, like I said in the beginning, when you have gone through a very challenging, very difficult marriage, very abusive, and when we talk about abuse, please don't think of blows, physical abuse. Abuse can be emotional, it can be financial, it can mm. be... Can it be spiritual? It can be spiritual. Someone can be going to juju people to cook up something for you so that you die, so that they take the wealth. It, yeah, abuse is abuse, but it's not just physical abuse. So when you've gone through the abuse of that difficult marriage, it strips you of confidence. It's like the abuse takes a piece of the fight each single day. Yeah. The abuse takes a fight out of you. It's like... How am I going to strips survive today? Mm. So it strips you of confidence. Yeah. Then it strips you off of self-esteem. It strips you off of resilience. 
because you're coming out getting hit and then go back then coming back getting hit so what I say is for a marriage to work you have to ensure that you don't lose all the fight don't lose it now channel that fight into making your marriage work mm -hmm. because from my experience you don't want to spend more time than you need to in the transition because it starts showing when you're stuck in the transition it starts showing okay it shows in your habits it shows in your conduct in your relationships it, oh, so friendships much. oh you become mm. moody you become emotional or you become difficult some people just be some people are difficult not because they're difficult but they're difficult because they are being hit every single day and by the time you meet them they're just terrible people not because they're terrible but look man i'm i'm just done it's, it's the battle it's the so battle i'm involved in what i always in. say don't wait for when the fight has ended in you but use the last fight the last resolve in your spirit in your soul to make the marriage work okay i'm not advocating for people to get divorced but it no. will happen yeah and that's a different conversation but if you're still married use the last bit of fighting that you have left to make the marriage to make the marriage work well, don't yeah. do marriage haphazardly maybe the last fight you have in you is to call for a family meeting you know some people divorce and it shocks families <laughs> because they never saw it coming. <laughs> yes. Case in point. Because families were like, what? Till today, my you friend... You called a family meeting? Fr no. Oh. We called a family meeting when we were done. <laughs> so yeah. use the last fight in you to call elders, to call aunties, to call uncles. And this is what I say. Don't... Um, don't go to see your family and let your husband see his family alone because it's going to be biased conversations. He said this, she said this. Uh -huh. yeah. And it doesn't resolve anything. Call your family, his family, in one place. That's fighting. Okay. You're fighting to save it. And it's going to require you to be vulnerable, to get naked, to tell your family, look, this is not working. Help us. We're trying to save this. Yeah. And there will always be family members and, and, our, and pastors that will be willing to help you families. make it work. I, I started with families because yes. we come from our fam families first before we are members of churches. Yes, and before we are colleagues somewhere. Before we are colleagues, before, before the pastor. Mm. Some people feel it very embarrassing to take it to the family and they choose to do the pastors or other counselors. I would advise that they go seek professional counseling because uh -huh. marital counseling will help a lot. Did you go through it? Alone. Oh, not with not, your not, better half. Yes. Okay. So use the last bit of fighting you have to find solutions, to find ways to make the marriage work. Okay. But if you've reached the point where there is no fight left in you, we need to work on you now. See now, you see now yes, now the problem no is confidence, yeah. no self-esteem. Uh, uh, your clothes are not even fitting you anymore. Because it shows, Jackie, let me tell you, for women, for mm. women, you will see it in their faces. We don't hide things well. Yeah. I, 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 I meet people today and they tell me, what changed on your face? Did you start lightening your skin? Jackie, I have never changed my, my lotion. Mm. It's remained the but same. But there is something one of my friends told me. She told me that after going through your divorce, you stopped wearing dark clothes. I used That's to, interesting. Did you notice it yourself? I didn't know. Uh. But I would walk into a place and I immediately go for black, blue, gray. Uh -uh. Like my life was not colorful and yeah. it showed. And after I, the divorce... You started picking yes, yellow. Yes, my, my yellow. <laughs> and so <your> orange. <laughs> for women, it will come out in different ways. Okay. Maybe you stop doing your hair. Maybe if you like to make up, you stop then doing you stop makeup. Doing makeup. Yeah. Or you overdo it to compensate or to hide what is really going on. Or you stop eating. Depression will do many things to you. Or you start <laughs> eating a lot. Yeah. Or you stop, you, you know, you start drinking alcohol. Excess excess consumption of alcohol as a way of covering up as a way of soothing the pain 
or you start smoking or you start having um, sexual intercourse that is just all over the place with whoever shows with whoever up. shows up mm. yeah some of these things highlight pain that is hidden somewhere yeah. that people have not touched and it's scary to touch those things so you so, so let's just say, let me let me not go there let me not touch that but then you end up doing things that affair upon mm. affair upon affair and it's not love relationship it's just let's do this then then it's the next woman or it's the next man like pause that use the fight you're using to numb your pain into resolving the yeah, pain the pain barbara as a mother what are you doing deliberately to keep your children in check mm -hmm. today you're wearing both hearts you're both the mother and the father i have a feeling there's certain things you're doing deliberately because you still want your children to turn out well okay um i wear both hats most of the time but i have a seemingly good comparing relationship with the father of the oh, kids wow. so we he he's very present in their lives and for that i'm very grateful uh but since i'm the one with the full custody of the kids staying with them monday to friday like most of the time yes both roles dad and mom it's exhausting so we i'm going from being dad to being mom to being dad again to it's hard and it's exhausting but now to answer your question I'll, I'll, I'll answer it like this. You know how we have had this movement of empowering the girl child? This is where I get my inspiration from this reflection. Mm -hmm. We have had the movement of empowering the girl child and it's very powerful, it's very commendable. This woman empowerment movement where we empower women, they become women entrepreneurs, we send our girls to uni, then they go do their masters, then they do their PhD, then they become the CEO of this and that. Yeah. It's beautiful, but we tend to forget that this girl child is going to fall in love with a young man who has not been equipped, empowered mm -hmm. as much as she has been. Yes, I understand the logic of empowering our girl children. I understand it. But then our brothers, our sons, our cousins, our nephews haven't been trained on how to handle this girl child who is empowered be tripling yeah. his salary yes so how do we tell this man that it's okay that she's making triple or quadruple your salary it's fine she's not the ceo at home though she wears that hat she wants more from you so when she comes at home that's not the moment to break her but the moment to build her so that by the time she goes to the world she's the best ceo hiya so I once sat, because I have two boys, and I said, okay, someone somewhere is having daughters who will be the wives of my sons. Do I want those mothers to cry because I did a terrible job of raising my sons as good humans, as good men who didn't only go to school who not only have their businesses, because at some point I want them to have their businesses, but who are good men at home, who can be good fathers. Good sons-in-law. Good sons-in-law. I want their mothers-in-law to be like, Barbara did a great job, thank you. I don't have to sleep wondering what happens to my daughter tonight. Wow. So I am not only raising my kids to have the best grades in school and let's talk about parenting motherhood yes and fatherhood to the people who are watching this yeah. i am not only raising my kids to have the best grades go to the best universities um have the best uh, jobs in this country i am raising the best dads to come the best sons-in-law the best uh, humans to work with because we know we work with some people who are very difficult mm. and it all goes back to the families and they are bringing and what we put in our kids yeah. and I am raising my next guardians because when I turn 80 these boys better take good care of me and they better do it in a way that their wives do not feel inconvenienced because they're already great husbands 
So yeah, I, that, I, I that want is, to age that well. Is deep. That I want well, to have that, a great soft life in my 80s. Please. You don't want someone's daughter to be cursing the mother-in-law. No. no. Mm -mm. My daughters-in-law will not curse my existence because God has invested so much in this. I don't want my daughters-in-law, I don't want my grandchildren to be like, Grandma? Mm -mm. She's, she's a writer, she's all these things, but she's a terrible woman. We're not going to spend the holiday with her because the children, because the grandchildren will say and, that. And I don't want to grow old alone. Yeah. So when we think of parenting, we don't think of 30, 40, 50 years from now. So some people grow old alone. The grandchildren can't visit because granddad, grandma. <sighs> no, dad, if we don't go with you, we are not going. I want my grandchildren to come and spend the night, nights at home. I want my daughters-in-law to be like, we're going to visit our mother, not yeah. our mother-in-law. Mm -mm. Our mother. So that's the picture I have in mind. Coming back to today, <sighs> wow. I teach my kids, I teach my sons wow. not to grow up as boys, but to know that they can clear their tables, wash their dishes, make their beds. Uh, wash their socks. Eventually, they can make you tea. Mommy wants. Yeah. Yes. Eventually, they will learn how to cook. Cause oh. what if my sons marry badass CEO women? Mm -hmm. Will they tell them quit your job because I'm feeling insecure being the husband who makes less money, or will they empower their wives because they were raised by an empowered mother? That is something to ponder. That's powerful. Robert. So when we parent, Jackie, yeah, it's beyond good grades. It's beyond and it's not short term. It's beyond a great job after yeah. uni. It's it's more it's generations. It's the future of Rwanda. It's, it's what your children will be saying to your grandchildren about you. Imagine if I raise yeah. the next um, World Bank uh, director. Yeah. Or if I raise the next UNICEF international president of IMF. Yes, imagine. Yes, the Secretary General of the yes, UN. Yes, what kind of decisions will he make when he is that person? Or if I raise the best driver in the town, mm. will he be sober enough to know that he can't drink because he's driving? Wow, with such things. Just a few questions that will make us even know Barbara deeper. Barbara, what's your favorite book? The Bible, never gets old. Uh, I know, I it's a it. cliche because I'm a pastor, <laughs> but seriously, the Bible never gets old. It has, does it, it yes. has love stories, it has uh, battle stories, it has proverbs, it has so many things. Yeah, yeah It has it's leadership. It's, 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 uh, if you're talking about a movie, it's got romance yeah, in yes. it, it's got yes. action, horror. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Your favorite TV show? Ah, one, just one? Yeah, just one. The best. Is it so hard ah, to choose? It's so hard to choose. Okay, okay give me two. I'll give you two. I love Queen Sugar. Uh -huh. Queen Sugar. Uh, I'm yet to watch that. Queen Sugar used to air on OWN, mm. Oprah Winfrey Network. It's about a family in Louisiana. I love it. It's okay. very family oriented. And I know, yeah, this will shock some people. I loved mm. Scandal. <laughs> I loved Scandal too. Do you yeah. know why I love Scandal? From mm -hmm. a media communications perspective, PR yeah. perspective, yeah, I love there are how, lots of lessons to learn how from that. Olivia Pope handles business. Yeah. So I loved it for that. Though it has other themes. <laughs> that the I relationship, mean. the other one. With Fitz, <laughs> present Fitz. Yeah. But yeah, I loved the PR and media comms mm. uh, themes around it. Yes. It was handled well. It was yes, showcased yes. well. Yes, I loved the writing. Yeah. Then what do you do for self-care? I allow myself to be lazy. <laughs> what do you mean? Saturday morning. Uh. Yes. Like wake up at 11 a.m.? I will not check my emails. I don't have to respond to any emails. I don't have to show up as Barbara, the communicator and the author and the, 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 the. Uh -uh. I'll just be myself, be lazy. Wake up, take break, you know, brush my Do you my take clothes. a bath? Yes, I do. Because lazy, some of us can take that really fast. I know. Mm? <laughs> I'm just like, I'm so bath, brush my teeth. <laughs> Take my breakfast uh -huh. and just watch TV oh. the whole day. I don't want to think of anything intelligent. <laughs> no. It's the soft I life. Self, soft life, self-care. Yes. And then the worst moment of your life, what would that be? When my mother died and we had, I had to bury her when I was pregnant with my first bone. I, I have failed to find a moment that surpasses that yeah. yet. Yeah, so... Yeah, May God terrible. help me not that find was your first something. child. Yes. Yeah. So yes. A, a lot of pregnant mothers will look forward to their mother helping mm. them nurse the child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah, you were deprived of that. Yes. And what would be the best moment? We leave the worst. Let's go to the best. Breastfeeding my kids. 
Mm. I know. What Rest is that? Feeling, that moment when you're holding a baby and they are looking at you, like babies have a way they look at you. Yeah. And <sighs> I know people that will be thinking my boobs are gonna suck, and so this moment, mm -hmm, I better not last long. But you're saying you Sis, chose that. I don't care about the sagging. <laughs> I'm here to breastfeed my kids. Anyway, they don't even breastfeed for so long. Yeah, <laughs> boys. Yeah. That's interesting. That between cooking and laundry, what would you oh, go Jackie, for? Why would you put mm. me on the spot? Why? <laughs> it's it's a question I'll ask you forever. But I'm like, I, I look at you and I already can tell the things you cannot do. So just answer okay, it. Okay, let me answer it in a very politically correct way. I'll choose cooking. And mm. cooking meat because I love eating meat. <laughs> Please don't make me cook other things. I know how to cook these other things, but I love cooking meat. I'll so cook you're not them. cooking ugali, no. sombe, no, dodo? Jackie, no, Jackie, why ugali? Like the fighting with ugali. <laughs> no. Let me cook your meat and the chicken. Uh, yeah. No, no, ugali. Barbara. <laughs> Are you sure See, this I'm is lazy. no? Hold on, you're lazy. I'm lazy. First, you, 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 what you do for self care is lazy. get lazy. You choose laziness. Yes. And then between cooking and laundry, no cooking. But you're only I'll singling cook, out meat. I'll cook meat. Are you sure? <laughs> are you sure this is not the reason you are? <laughs> you, you, they left you. Okay. I, I don't have a better way of putting this. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, my, yeah. my, the father of my kids, it came from Congo because of the history of our nation. Anything, you know, mm. the details. I'll not go through them. And then people who come from that part love to eat good food. Mm -hmm. So when we had just gotten married, one of my friends who comes from Congo told me, Barbara, you've married someone from Congo. You better have your cooking A game <laughs> on point. They love their food. They love good food. Not good their food. Not their food. Good food. So he, he told me he was a grown up. I call him an uncle because uh, his kids are the same age as I am. And he told me, Barbara, when your in-laws visit, you better have fish, you better have ugali, you better have beef mm -hmm. and some chicken. I was like, what, is it at a restaurant? Uh -huh. He's like, yeah, if you don't have your egg game, your cooking egg game on point, you will not last. Hiya. Hey, but I didn't okay. last. But you I didn't last. You didn't last. <laughs> Barbara, you didn't cook. You did not cook good food. <laughs> Jackie, you should visit you me. Did. I'll give you food. I yeah. will. Darling, yes. thank you. Thank you this so much. This has been thank you. such an eye opener. It's it was. been such an thank exciting you. conversation. Thank, thank you, you thank so much. You. I enjoyed Barbara. myself. And continue serving. You're yes. a minister. Yes. In yes. many different ways. And yes. we yes. all look up yes. to you. Yes. Just continue being you. Amen You're a star. To thank that. you, my dear. Thank you. If you're not good in your copy of Shaped, please go out and buy it. You'll find it at the airport. You'll find it at the bookstores around town. Get it? If there's anything that has not been said on this show, you will find it in the book. My name is Jackie Lumbas. It's always a pleasure to have you with us on The Real Talk. And we want to thank our hosts, Kigali Serena Hotel, for enabling us to bring you this episode from the comfort of this space. We will see you next week. God bless you. <laughs>